when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Amen. I wish to speak to you this morning about the cross, that stark symbol at once powerful and terrifying, beautiful and absurd, liberating and killing. There is no image more closely linked with Christianity, no symbol that more powerfully evokes the full story. Here I am talking of Jesus' story, of course, but also of our imperfect efforts to engage it. Many of us wear a cross about the heart, a gracious emblem of faith publicly understood. We sit inside one of the world's great cathedrals, stones piled expertly in the shape of the cross. In just a few days, pilgrims will venerate the rugged wood of the cross, and the passion story will be proclaimed for all the world to hear. Indeed, oppressed people throughout history have pointed to the cross as the strongest symbol known that God takes their side and knows their story. And so in these ways, the cross is a powerful symbol of liberation, yet the pages of history are filled with images of the cross that disturb. In Jesus' day, it was a terrifying machine of torture, left in the open for days to scare the populace. Later, it was emblazoned red on the crusader's shield. The cross was held before forced converts during the Inquisition, burned in front yards as an act of terror, and broadcast even today by those who would use the message of Jesus to judge and divide, to shame or to gin up votes, to proclaim a message of hate. But I refuse to cede the evangelical message that good news project of grace to those who would distort it in such ways. I cannot understand Jesus as anything less than a table-turning revolutionary, God incarnate sent for the sake of the world to show us how to love. From the cross, Jesus faced Rome's system of domination, and he exposed it for the death trap that it was, and he said, Father, forgive, and he loved them to the end. He was born in a barn to parents bending and breaking to meet the demands of imperial Rome. Refugees who could not find a room because they were nobodies to nobody. Indeed, John's Gospel uses the word cosmos to describe this world, not the glory of God's creation, but rather the world as the fallen realm that is estranged from God's will and opposes God's work. And Bible scholar Walter Wink translates this cosmos to mean system. It was indeed a system of domination. Rome could do whatever it wanted, whenever it wanted, to whomever it wanted. Rome could tax your land, could make you carry a soldier's heavy pack for a mile, could humiliate you in front of everyone, and they did all the time. And so it was into this darkness that erupted the light of Jesus. He exposed and he rejected the system of violence domination as he proclaimed a very different kingdom which was of God. And in God's kingdom the first shall be last and little children shall lead. The poor are blessed and the meek are exalted. 
He taught people assertive ways to resist the empire and to insist that they had value as God's children, even all the while, while Rome shrieked that they were little more than cogs in a grinding, merciless machine. Jesus taught us to turn cheeks, to walk extra miles, and to give shirts, but the empire was displeased as were the religious authorities, because Jesus taught that the glory of God would not be constrained by giant temples, and that God's word would not be held captive by holy men with the proper training and credentials. Indeed, he sought to draw all people to himself regardless of station or power. In time, the powers and the principalities were finished with this man, and they concluded he must die which brings us to the cross. How then are we to understand it? Is it a blood sacrifice to an angry God? Indeed, this substitutionary atonement theory of the cross has been peddled for centuries, causing great damage. You've probably heard it from someone. As the story goes, humanity's sin causes a vengeful God such rage that someone must suffer. Jesus takes the pain for all of us, and our salvation is found in his suffering, a blood offering to an angry God. But let me be clear, this is not the God revealed in Scripture. What of God's love and justice and mercy and compassion? starting with Yahweh's forgiveness after the golden calf fiasco in Exodus, moving through Jeremiah's promise of iniquities forgiven and exemplified in Jesus' life and teaching, we cannot understand Yahweh, the God of the Old and New Testaments, and the one Jesus calls Abba, as anything other than love. And what's more, we must reject a theology that would separate the Father from the Son. How and why could God punish God's self? And so how then are we to make sense of this cross? As Paul writes, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. How does the cross save? And where does its power come from? We cannot and should not hide the brutality of it. Oppressed people have pointed to the cross as the clearest symbol yet, that God knows their story and takes their side and feels their pain. As one of my mentors who is African American writes, do not take the blood from the cross because my people shed a lot of it. And also sin is our biggest problem. We all fall short of God's righteousness. We miss the mark. We give in to greed over charity, self over other, fear over love. And try as we might, we are stuck in this sinful state. It is a gulf that separates us from God. We cannot earn our way across this gulf. We need God's mercy. And the cross is truly the crux of God's forgiveness. Why? Theologians Karl Barth and Karl Rahner offer a new and powerful perspective. God kept saying yes to the world, and the world kept saying no to God. God said yes to the world in the primal blur of creation, but the world kept saying no to God by turning from God's will. God kept saying yes to the world by sending prophets and sages to reveal a righteous law. As Walter Brueggemann writes of the prophet Jeremiah, God does not do these things merely out of some stubborn faithfulness, but out of deep, wounded love and profound grief that have moved God beyond anger to tender caringly, to tender caring, and most importantly, to forgiveness. We realize with Dr. King that there can be no deep disappointment where there is not deep love. And so it was out of love that Yahweh would make today's incredible promise in Jeremiah. 
I will put my law within them, God says, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And God never broke that covenant, but we, the people, did. And then in the fullness of time, God so loved the world that God said yes again and sent his only son for the sake of the world. But the world kept saying no to Jesus. We scorned him and we challenged him. And ultimately, we said no in the strongest possible terms by putting him to death, even death on a cross. And in the midst of all this, God still waits for a yes from the world. And this is where and this is how the cross saves Because Jesus, God incarnate, intercedes on our behalf. That conversation between Father and Son in today's Gospel continues, and Jesus says, Father, forgive them, all of them, everybody, all the time, for everything, for they know not what they do. And because Jesus was fully human, incarnate in this world, finally the world could say yes back to God. And so all is forgiven. And the cross becomes the ultimate mark of amazing grace. And there's more to the cross's power. Because arms outstretched from across a lonely, cold stone, Jesus looked out at the stone walls of Jerusalem. And past there he could see the valley of the shadow of death and all the roads that that led straight to Rome. He saw the worst of the system of domination. Indeed, he felt its violence in his body. He stared it down, he exposed it, and ultimately he rejected it. Because there could have been an armed revolt back in the garden, but he told his followers instead to lay down their arms. He prayed for deliverance from the passion, but ultimately he promised to follow God's will for his life. And from the cross, he might still have sought vengeance for those who wounded him so grievously and so brutally, but instead he prays God to forgive them. And he promises after his resurrection to bring all people to himself. And so there was a nasty storm on three o'clock on that first Good Friday, but stones were about to roll away. And centuries after the Roman Empire crashed and collapsed under its own cruelty, people across the globe would be sharing Jesus' story and not Rome's. He said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. By this, people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And is there a better summary of the epitome of discipleship of Jesus? By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Yet we, like the disciples are perhaps afraid to let God all the way in. There is shame we try to hide even from God. There are secrets even God can't handle, or so we think. I used to play piano for an Alcoholics Anonymous service, and it was one of the great pleasures of my life and of my ministry. Nadia Boltz Weber says that if you want to find the deepest honesty in the church, look downstairs where the 12-step groups are meeting. Here I looked up from the piano often to see grown men in tears as we all acknowledged our brokenness and our deep need for Christ's forgiveness. Mercy in this gathering was no abstract concept. No, it was as real as bread on the tongue. It was as gritty as sweaty palms held together in prayer. And one day during communion, an odd couple approached the railing. He was old and tired and unkempt. He wore a threadbare Red Sox t-shirt and a dirty baseball cap, and she was dressed to the nines. And as they approached the railing, he held out his withered hands, which had seen decades of drunken madness, 
And he said to his wife, I am so sorry. And I love you. And she put her hand on his shoulder with her ring still on. And she said, I love you. And I forgive you. And together they received communion. So today, I have something to say to you. As we prepare to approach this table which Jesus prepares for us, God loves you. God loves you so deeply that God sent his son Jesus for you. And there is nothing in your entire life, nothing in my entire life, that God cannot handle. There is no secret too deep or too dark or too dirty, no shame too large that God cannot wash away through grace and with God's incredible gift of forgiveness. Indeed, grace will meet us here, and grace will lead us home. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see.